Hello everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how I did this portrait of Tilly and Khan with the bluebell background. Now this is done entirely with pastels and I started off with the background first. Now this is normally the case if I do have a background of any kind, even if it is a simple glow background which you might have seen on some of my pet portraits. The main reason for that is usually, especially when you've got dogs that have got long coats like on the ears here of the spaniels, some of that fur is going to overlap the background. So I like to be able to have my background in place first. It doesn't necessarily have to be finished, but about 80% complete. And then when I come to work on the dogs, I'm going to be able to then layer some of that fur over the background. That's going to make the artwork that much more realistic. You wouldn't want there to be a harsh line around your subject where the fur isn't overlapping the background because then they tend to look a bit like stickers. We don't want that, we want the background and the subject to be one complete piece. The reference photo I had of Tilly and Khan, they were sat side by side, it was a really nice photo of them both, but the background was dull. So their owner asked me to sort of do a scenic background that would complement them and just create a unique piece. Now Tilly the chocolate cocker spaniel on the left had some purple highlights in her fur so straight away a bluebell background sprung to mind. And that's one of the biggest tips that I can give anybody where they are changing the background from their subject. You want to make sure that you drag some of those colours into your subject, into the fur, to make sure that the whole piece looks complete. I wouldn't want anybody looking at this portrait and thinking that the background and the subjects were separate. I want them to think that that's a really nice photograph that I worked from and not realising that I've completely changed the background. And what I'll do is at the end of this video, I'll show you the reference photo that I had to work from and the layout that I created in order to get this portrait. And that will show you the, the real difference in this, this portrait that I've created. So I will just quickly mention that if you'd like to see this background in significantly slower footage, it's available over on my Patreon channel. And because it is significantly slower, you can really see how I move in that soft tool, the colours that I'm using, the techniques that I'm using in order to get this nice soft effect. So as I say, I'll put all of that information in the description below. And you'll see that for this background, I haven't used any pastel pencils at all. I did this all with the oval shaped soft tool with my sanded soft pastel sticks, which is my preference. The pan pastels would also work, but you can see here to get that nice out of focus effect, I've not used my pencils whatsoever. The problem with using the pencils is we'd be tempted to put too much detail in, whereas for a distant background like this, we want everything to be out of focus and blurry. So if you are someone who likes to put too much detail in because I'm guilty of that in the fur stick to your blending tools whether or not that's your sponges or the soft tools there your eye makeup applicators stick to those to do your background if you want it to be out of focus now if you've seen many of my videos here on YouTube you'll know that when I come to working on the subject I like to start with the eye the reason for that is that's the soul of that animal so I want to make sure that I get that correct before I work on any other elements if we get the eye wrong, obviously it's not going to then look like that dog. So it's one of the most important elements of any portrait. So here, this is still using my sanded soft pastel sticks. As I say, the pan pastels would work in the same way. The reason why I still prefer my sanded soft pastel sticks rather than pan pastels in most instances is because they're harder to fill the tooth of the paper. The pan pastels are incredibly soft in their pigment, so it can be quite easy, especially if you're new to pastels, to use them and fill the tooth of the paper too early on. Now what that will do is, is it will restrict how many additional layers you can put on top, which is obviously then going to limit how much realism we can get in our fur. But I have found the sanded soft pastel stick method, because it feels like a different texture, I don't seem to have that same chance of filling the tooth of the paper too soon so if that is something that you're struggling with this method may may be of interest so you'll see that i like to work in small areas so once i've got the base layer around the eye done and the initial few layers of detail i'm then going to start working on the ear and for this i'm working from dark to light i've got my sort of basic shadows my shapes in place and then i'm going to build up from there now cocker spaniel ears are challenging so i do have a one and a half hour tutorial over on patreon focusing on how i break down something like this the main thing that i start off with is as i say i block in my shadows and where the main sets of shapes are and as you can see here i'm working in a couple of square inches at a time working from the top and then working my way down 
The key to a fur type like this is how everything overlaps and layers on top of each other. So we want to start working on the fur that's closest to the skin and build up from there. You can see that I'm leaving all of these wispier details right until the very end because they overlap everything else. Now my Patreon channel does focus on fur types, more, more dog portraits, so if you want to have a look at what's available over there, I've got a Patreon library on my website, which I'll also link in the description below, so that you can see the kinds of tutorials that I've got available over there. And now that we've got both eyes in, you can see that the reflections are what make the eyes that much more realistic. I've made sure that they're nice and bright, they've got the sharp contrast of the pupils with that nice subtle colouring of the iris. But the main thing when we are working on eyes is if they've got that strong highlight to make sure that we've got that as bright as it needs to be. Now I speak about a lot in all of my tutorials about the contrast. In order to get that we need to get our lights as bright as they need to be and our shadows as dark as they need to be. If you look at the side of the ear where it joins up to the side of her face that's really nice and dark. Now also something else to bear in mind is the light source. So it's coming more, it's sort of a bit more overall in this photo. There isn't a strong light source to one side, but it does adjust the colouring slightly. So if you look at how much cooler the colours on her face are compared to the browns of her ears. So all of those little adjustments that we are noticing at the time that we're doing this layering process is going to help to make the fur in our portraits that much more realistic. And that brings me on to something else as well when you are incorporating a background into a pet portrait piece. So you want to make sure that the sort of the light source on in for instance the trees here on the side would be the same as on the light source on the dogs. Now with this there wasn't that much of a light source as I say coming from one side so I didn't have to worry about that as much here but if you do have a woodland piece for example and you see that the highlights on the trees are on one side but the highlights on your dog or the subject are on another side you're going to have to decide which light source you want. You're either going to stick with the one on the dog or the one on the background. So that's really important because obviously see again that will then indicate that your photo your background and your reference photo for the animal are different. Now knowing whether or not you've got your contrast correct is something that can be a challenge so the one tip that would work for that and to double check that is to photograph your artwork and turn the reference photo and that photo of your artwork black and white into grayscale and then you can clearly see the difference between your highlights and your shadows. It's a lot easier to judge that contrast when you're working from a black and white image so that's one thing that can certainly help. If you then notice that your highlights aren't as bright as the black and white copy of your reference photo you then know that you you need to make your highlights that much brighter and the same with the shadows. They may then need to be made darker in order to get that contrast where it needs to be. So you can see now that even at the base layer stage how many purple tones, some of the magenta colours that I'm putting in here to make sure that I've got some of that bluebell background reflecting up into the fur. Now Tilly here on the left had a really lovely shine to her coat so I wanted to make sure that I got that in my portrait. So I did all of the base layer, normally you don't see me work with a base layer on such a larger scale but because I wanted to make sure that I got that seamless transition between the shine of her coat I wanted to make sure that I got this base layer as smooth as it needed to be. I've therefore made my darks as dark as they needed to be by putting some of that black Rembrandt soft pastel stick in some of these shadows here. Now you don't often see me put the soft pastel sticks directly to the paper because it does fill the tooth of the paper very quickly but in this instance I wanted these areas here to be as dark as I could possibly get in order to get the shine of the coat. Now getting shine in the coat regardless of the breed is all in your lights and your darks. The shine is only apparent because you've got your shadows really dark and that are right next to your highlights. So you can see that the fur that I'm working on here, it already starts to look like it's got that nice shine where she's got that silky coat because I've got my shadows as dark as they need to be next to it. And that's one of the most common questions that I'm asked and it's that my details don't show up on top of my base layers. Now quite often the main reason for that is that your base layers aren't dark enough. If you make your base layers a couple of shades darker, your details are then going to be able to show up that much clearer rather than sticking with a lighter pencil because what will happen is if you select a larger, uh, lighter pencil, you're then going to end up with a lighter portrait than you might not necessarily need. So in that instance you might then be better off darkening your base layers because quite often that is the cause. Most of the time we're too worried about going too dark in case we ruin it but what that often results in is you'll end up with a lighter coloured dog than what you're actually going for.
And the good thing with pastels is they're a very forgiving medium. So if you do go too dark, which often very rarely happens, but if you do find you've gone too dark, you can just layer another lighter colour on top. Now you'll see here as well that I'm drawing right up to that tape that I've got my, my pastel matte paper secured to my drawing board. The reason being is I don't want my background or the subject where it does meet the edge of the paper to have a space and almost create that bit of that glow around the subject and the edge of the paper. So if you are working on something like this where you've got an element that covers all of that paper right to the edge, make sure that you do draw right up to your masking tape. So you can see what here, I'm using this soft tool, more like a paintbrush. I'm picking up some of these browns, the darker colours, some of those purples to make sure that I've got my base layer with that nice rich colour that I need in order to get this fur with that nice purple tone. And then working the same way that I did with the left ear and working from dark to light, making sure that I've put my main sets of shadows in place to get that flow and shape of the ear correct. One of the biggest tips I can give anybody if they are struggling with the base layer stages, especially on spaniel ears, because as I say, it's an awful lot of layering to go on there, is apply a Gaussian blur to your reference photo because that will help to really hide all those details so that you can just focus on the initial values, your lights and your darks and the main sets of shapes. And now I'm on to Khan. So exactly the same process, I start with the eye first. You can see that I've already got some of those purples reflecting up into that bottom eyelid. I've got those sharp highlights of the eye in place as well. Now this here was still the oval shaped soft tool but the end of the sponge was damaged and I wasn't using the rear section so I just ended up cutting it in half. If you do end up using your sponges like that, just make sure that the plastic applicator on the inside doesn't scratch your paper. Now for the liver sections here and the brown patches on Khan here, the colours are going to be very similar to Tilly. So I still had the same set of colours mixed on my bit of sandpaper to the side of me and it's just the, about the same sort of layering process. So working from dark to light, the values that are closest to the skin first and building up from there. Obviously his fur is going to be different when we get to the white fur which is another element that can be very challenging on its own. But when it comes to white fur, even on the middle stripe here between the eyes, is white fur, just like black fur, is really reflective. So it's going to have all of those colours from the background, potentially, that's going to be bouncing up from that light source into the fur. So we want to make sure that regardless of what the element that we're working on, we're always dragging those background colours into the fur. Now for this portrait, I've used quite a few of the Caran d'Ache pencils. They do some nice browns, their purple is also very nice. The problem with it is they do often contain these gritty little nuggets within the lead. So it's although I've got a few of the colours there that I am using, I don't have the full set. My Carbofellows Pits and my Derwents are certainly my go-to pencils. But as I say, out of the Caran d'Ache range, there is a few there that I like to have. The browns, as I say, for this, the purple. The Dark Flesh 50% is also one of my favourites. Now something else with this ear here, you can see that some of the pencil strokes are varied. Some are longer while others are shorter. So really study that photo to see where that difference in the fur length is because again, not only just with the colouring, but the length of our pencil strokes can really affect how much realism we get in our artwork. Here on the muzzle is a prime example. This fur can compared to the ear is going to be considerably shorter. So we want to make sure that we replicate that to get that difference in texture. And here where you can see both edges of the ears here from Tilly and Khan, you can see just how many of the first strokes overlap the background. Going back to what I spoke about at the beginning of the video and why I like to do my background first, this just shows it perfectly. All of those browns, those lighter highlights are overlapping that background to make it look like the dogs are in front. But you'll also see that these details are not all traveling in the same direction. They're curving and flowing in different ways because that's how spaniel ears do naturally flow. Because it does have that longer fur type, it's not all gonna be the same direction like on the fur on the top of the head like what I'm working on now. Spaniel fur on the top of the head is quite longer than something potentially on a Labrador or a Jack Russell, for instance. So we want to make sure that we've got some of these details that are longer. And you can see that on the top of the white stripe here. Some of these longer white lines are overlapping the background to make sure that I'm showing that the fur is getting longer as it gets to the top of the head compared to between the eyes. Really noticing these length of the fur strokes is going to really make such a difference to that finished piece. 
Now, if judging the fur length is something that you do struggle with, one thing that you can do is print out your reference photo the same size as the artwork, and then you'll be able to see how long each pencil stroke needs to be. Now, printer ink is expensive, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that in colour. A black and white copy would give you the, the same... Um, same judgment you can then see that first stroke we're not really focusing on the color for that most printers don't print color accurately anyway so that's another reason why my preference is using a tablet for my reference photo but for just judging the fur length a black and white printed copy will will work just fine now normally on my videos you'll see that I say to leave the whiskers until the very end but here I put them into just at this stage because I knew that I'd finished with the ears and the fur around it but if you haven't finished an area of the fur to the side where the whiskers do overlap leave the whiskers until the very end they overlap everything else so you don't want to have to then be drawn around them if you realize that you haven't finished the fur behind it. Now, tongues, teeth and gums are one of the most challenging aspects of a portrait. But just like when we're drawing fur, it's all about the lighting. And in order to get that wet look, it's about getting your highlights as bright as they need to be and the shadows as dark as they need to be. One thing to consider when you are drawing a tongue as well is to really study that photo to look at the colour. Some tongues are going to be more of the purple side of the colour wheel while others are going to contain a lot more pinks. So really do look at that to see whether or not you need to be on the cooler end of the colour wheel or the warmer end of the colour wheel. Now here I haven't got a huge amount of space to add all the details but I've already made it look like the gum all in my lighting. I've got a really strong highlight in the middle section there and that's indicating that the gum there is starting to roll over to the lower section of the cheek. Now if you look at the gum area there I haven't had a huge amount of area to get those details in place but it already looks realistic and that's all in the lighting. I've got that lower section of the lip there as dark as it needs to be with those nice warmer highlights in the middle. So even if we're working in a smaller area we can still get that degree of realism only by sort of indicating at that light source. Usually for smaller areas, that's all that's needed in order to still get that finished effect, that type of photorealism that we're after. Okay, so when drawing white fur, the biggest tip is white fur is never truly white. There are many colours that are within that fur in order to get that depth. Now here's a prime example. I have got a lot of greys. I've got some warmer greys, cooler greys. I'm going to bring in some of those purples that's going to be reflecting through. But the biggest thing to remember is it's never truly white. Although I am using my white carbo fellow, I'm putting it on top of my darker base layers. Now, how I approach white fur is going to vary depending on the reference photo. But for something like this, I've started off with my darker base layer and I've worked up from there. The one thing that you'll notice though is that my darker base layers are in the middle where the first starts to get a little bit more dense but the base layers on the left hand side and the right hand side I've started with a lighter base layer. It's still not a white base layer, it's more of a lighter grey but it's not as dark as my base layers in the middle. And that really is a judgment call and as I say it varies depending on the photo that I'm working on at the time. If I've got an air of the white fur that's particularly bright I will start off with a lighter base layer. If it looks like the middle section here of his chest it's got more of those shadowed areas showing through I will start off with a slightly darker base layer. And white fur, just like with anything, it's a layering process. You can see how many layers I've got here to get that softness, that dense of density of that fur in place. But for a fur type like this, it's also in the fur direction. So how they're clumped together, how they're flowing, how they're curving, the way that they're traveling. All of these different elements are going to really make that fur in this area look that much more realistic. If you draw the fur too straight and too uniformed, it will look fake. But on the other hand, pay really close attention to that photo because the direction of the fur isn't random. It is there for a reason. It will follow the bone and muscular structure of that animal. So on Khan's chest on the right, you can see where his shoulder blades would be, where I've indicated that the fur changes direction. And here is the finished portrait that I've done here. This is A3 size. This is approximately 12 by 16. And here is the reference photo that I had and my finished artwork. So you can really see what I was saying about how the background, it was really nice to do something different and add a bit of colour to it. But something else that I will mention as well at this point, the reason why this background worked so well with this reference photo is because the photo was taken at their level. 
This angle gives you so many more options for the background because obviously the perspective can then be much more easily replicated in that background to match the subject. If your reference photo, the angle was taken at a higher shot and above the dog's face, obviously that's then gonna limit how, what type of background you can do. But if you certainly have a photo like this where it is at their level, you can add so many different options for scenic backgrounds, but you do need to make sure that the perspective, as well as all the other elements that I've spoken about in this tutorial, all piece together to make sure that everything does flow naturally. So I really hope this tutorial here was of use. If it was, I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content and the videos that I upload, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And as always, I'll be uploading another video next weekend.